heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, a new bidder emerges for TikTok. We sit down with the Project Liberty founder, Frank McCourt, to discuss. Plus, we'll bring you the takeaways from Google's annual I.O. developers conference. And OpenAI's chief scientist, who played a key role in Sam Altman's ouster, but he's departing the company. We'll discuss that and so much more throughout the hour. But first, let's check in on these markets. There is a macro playbook happening and it is a cooler CPI print being digested by the market that sends stocks to record highs. Record highs on the Nasdaq, record highs on global stocks more broadly. The S&P, the stock 600 over in Europe also getting a lift because people start to factor in that maybe we'll, we'll get those rate cuts from, from the Federal Reserve. 10-year yield therefore diving down seven basis points. Bonds rally, yields fall. Move on because the dollar is down. And what does that mean? Crypto is higher. We're seeing a real risk on feel to today's trade. We're up almost 5% on Bitcoin. But Ed, what are you looking at on the micro? OK, so Google or Alphabet shares higher for a second day. We will go later in the show to our reporter that was on the ground. New AI back search, uh, new iterations of the models. Clearly, investors like something in there. So we'll unpack all the new technology. There's a few other things that I'm watching. Uh, some movers in the, to the downside in the mega caps that are a drag on the NASDAQ 100, both Amazon and Tesla lower. Amazon interesting because lower for a second day after the news that Adam Zlipsky is leaving as AWS CEO and Matt Garman goes into the AWS CEO seat. And then Microsoft's higher percentage point, I put it in there as a proxy for OpenAI which we'll discuss later in the show, but it is higher, Caroline, by a percentage point. Very big AI focus uh, and, and in a crowded field right now. It is crowded. And also, we're being crowded for news flow right now, particularly when we think about this world of social media, the future ownership of social media, and a key player, of course, that needs to be divested or indeed be banned from the US. We want to discuss TikTok now. Welcome our Bloomberg TV and radio audiences worldwide to join... The Project Liberty founder and McCourt Global Executive Chairman and billionaire Frank McCourt, who is building a consortium to bid for social media app TikTok's US business. Frank, welcome to the show. And how much money do you actually have to be offering to TikTok? Well, it's too early to know how much the TikTok is going to be sold for uh, or if it's going to be sold. We happen to believe it, it will be sold and uh, we're betting on that. It, we don't have the information yet, though, on what exactly they're selling or a peek at the financial statements. So we, we can't really tell what the price will be. But one thing that's important, Caroline, is we're not interested in the algorithm. Mm -hmm. it, so we're, we're interested in actually an alternative right. web where people own and control their data, own and control their identity. So we're not interested in, in ByteDance's uh, algorithm, which I think makes our bid particularly unique. Frank, we, we will discuss uh, later on, I think, the technology plan that's important, given that the algorithm is essentially put on an export ban list by China. But I'd be grateful in the first instance just to go through some of the mechanics here, if that's OK. For example, have you spoken to TikTok or ByteDance? Have you spoken to the US government about this bid? Yeah, we, we, we have not spoken to ByteDance or, or TikTok. We have spoken to a number of other actors in this and have been encouraged to, uh, to move forward with this approach. Remember, this is, this is putting forward an alternative vision for how the internet operates. You know, right now, uh, whether, it's Byte, whether it's TikTok, rather, or our own US platforms, our information, our data, our personhood actually is scraped from us, aggregated by these big platforms, and they apply algorithms to it. I think it's time, past time, really, that we have an alternative version of the internet where we each own and control our identity, own and control our data, and we have all the benefits of the, of the internet and, and the wonderful technology that's, that's there connecting all of us, but we're in charge of us. So yes. agency is returned to individuals. That's the technology we've been building over the last almost five years. I greenlit this project in December of 2019. So the tech works. We actually have a proof of concept. There's almost a million users now on this new protocol. So now it's time to scale it up and give people a real choice. Frank, you mentioned other actors. I'm conscious that, that Sequoia and General Atlantic, for example, 
are US-based firms that sit on the cap table of ByteDance. Do you have their support in your bid? It's, it's too early, Ed, for, for me to make these statements. We've, we've retained Guggenheim Securities as our advisor, along with Kirkland and Ellis as an advisor, to, to put together all the pieces of this bid. But let's, let's be realistic. This is early in a process. It's still very noisy. We don't know exactly what ByteDance will be selling. They've, they've filed uh, a lawsuit recently, so they're, they're fighting this. But I, I am confident that at the end of the day, they'll either have to sell or... Or, or shut it down. And we don't want to see TikTok shut down. There's 170 million users enjoying TikTok. We want to see them continue to enjoy it. But, but again, we're not interested in the algorithm, which I think makes our bid very, very unique. And uh, we can migrate these users over to a, a new version of the internet where the, where the 170 million users actually participate in the value they create and are in charge of their, of, of their data. Imagine a version of TikTok where the, the version is clicking on the terms of use of each of the 170 million users rather than uh, the 170 million users clicking on the terms of use of one platform. I don't think this data should be in the control of any one person, right. one company, or, uh, or, or Chinese Communist Party. I, I think it's important that we, we, we shift our mindset now and shift the paradigm from the internet we've been living with, which is doing real harms, uh, and it's, it's undermining democracy, it's, it's ripping society apart, and of course we're hearing more and more about the harms to children. Yes. Let's build a better version. We are with Frank McCourt, of course, a Project, Project Liberty founder, McCourt Global Executive Chairman, and across radio and TV, we're discussing your potential bid for TikTok, if indeed TikTok is to be sold, and that is a big if. But all of this sounds philanthropic. Do you not want any money back if you're going to be raising billions, oh. putting billions of your own potentially on the line here? Yeah, of course. I think it's interesting that it sounds philanthropic to you because I, I do think it does have the potential of being one of the biggest impact projects of our lifetime. Um, but this has to have commercial components to it, to be realistic. I mean, this can't be some alternative internet that is, you know, uh, better, better architected and healthier for people, but no one uses. So this will needs there be advertising? How will you make money back? Is it subscription-based? Yeah, uh, all of the above. Let's, let's think of it this way. Once you unleash the power and the innovation and the invention of a data-sharing economy, we're going to see uh, ideas and, and models that far exceed what we have today. Right now, we, we, all of this is tied up in just a few companies, just a few platforms. Let's unleash the innovation of, of everyone and unleash and, and, and have the value sharing proposition be a bit different. So of course there'll be commercial uses limited only by our imagination. And maybe there'll be some advertising models, maybe there'll be some Frank. subscription models, but, but it has to be highly commercial. Frank, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, th there's a recurring question. I think Caroline would back me up that I've been very consistent in asking it, which is there are 170 million US users of TikTok. And most of them quite like using it as it is. Uh, is there anything you can tell me about the product plan or your engagement with the existing user base that would convince that 170 million that they'll want to continue using it, whatever happens? Yeah, of course. They, 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 this is the key, the key to the transaction is for them to be excited about migrating to this new new. Uh, new model of the internet, let's call it, this, the, where, where they own and control their data and where they participate in the value. So the user experience has to be every bit as, as uh, easy, polished, and fun as it is now. And, 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 but we w wouldn't users be excited about actually being in charge and, and actually participating in the value? Um, and so, yeah, we, this has to be seamless in terms of the user experience, but the underlying technology will be far, far better. The design of the technology, putting them in charge of themselves. So, the, the, of course, it needs to be done in a way, Ed, where the users are, are as excited or more excited about their, you know, the new version. But remember, right now, there's a risk that it will be shut down. So we don't want to see it shut down. We want to see the 170 million users continue to be on a platform that our government is comfortable with and, and uh, that, you know, that ByteDance, quite frankly, is comfortable in selling it. Frank, we use words like consortium or, or even like coalition. Uh, 
there are a number of people who have, have raised their hand about doing something with TikTok's U.S. assets. Steve Mnuchin, uh, former Treasury Secretary, and Eric Schmidt, uh, one of the Google founders, kind of top of mind. Have you spoken to them and proposed, for example, that you all just get together, bring your intellectual capital, capital together in one bid? Uh, no, I have not. And, and I do want to distinguish our bid from what at least I understand their bids to be about. It, we, we don't need uh, Saudi money to do this bid, right? It, it, we're not talking about the same type of architecture where we just replace you know, Chinese ownership with, with, with another ownership and then we have a, a continue to have a centralized autocratic surveillance-based uh, technology where, where users' data is scraped and aggregated and so forth. This is not, a, our version is not a top-down approach. Our version is empower the users, empower people, and make this a people's bid. Make this something where, uh, where individuals have agency and, and, and choice and power returned to them. I, the, the harms that we're seeing with the internet, and this is not limited to TikTok, right? Our own platforms are built with the same model of scraping data and exploiting it. Isn't it time we have a better model? And I see this opportunity as a, a, it's a fantastic opportunity to take proven technology and scale it and give people a choice, an alternative. And Frank, you've got people who are at the forefront of that argument about the harms of social media, Jonathan Haidt being one of them with the anxious generation. It's all I see on social media at the moment. David Clark said Tim Berners-Lee, who helped create the World Wide Web. However, this sounds like you need crowdfunding, ultimately. How, if you don't need Saudi money, what money will you need when you get a price point? I think there'll be a combination of private capital, public, what I'll call public capital, and people's capital. So, so it will be crowdfunded? Uh, well, uh, crowdfunding has an implication, right? I don't think we're necessarily raising money on the internet. So that's not what we're talking about. But look, we've brought in Guggenheim Securities to help organize how we raise money. This should be, uh, it, the investors here should be abroad, should, should really reflect the broad coalition we're trying to create here about reclaiming the internet, right? And using this as an opportunity to, to do that. So I would imagine in addition to private capital, there would be uh, pension funds, endowments, foundations, philanthropies that, that are interested in a return, but not only a return on their capital. They have a longer term horizon and they would like to see the internet re-architected so it's better for for all of us, and it supports democracy, right? It supports civil society, it's a, it protects young children. And the, the book I wrote recently called Our Biggest Fight gets into some detail on yes. the harms that the current version of the internet are doing to all of us. It's not limited to children, but especially children. And I think our number one obligation is to protect kids. An impact, thought, leadership there from Frank McCourt, Project Liberty founder and McCourt Global Executive Chairman. We thank him for his time and his views on the bid. Ed, what have we got coming up? Okay, coming up on Bloomberg Technology, we'll bring you the big takeaways from Google's annual IO Developers Conference, the reporter that was on the ground. That's next. This is Bloomberg Technology. That was DJ Rabia at the IO Developers Conference testing out Google's DJ mode that Google recently added to its generative AI text to music tool. Google also rolled out a new search engine that includes responses written by AI. Bloomberg's Julia Love was at the Google IO Developers Conference under the big tent at that rave uh, and joins us for more. Let's put the DJ performance to one side for now. The big news, I think, was AI-powered search. 
absolutely right, Ed. This is a real sea change in Google search. Um, for the past year, Google has been experimenting with generative AI overviews, but that wasn't a special test version of the product. Now they're rolling out generative AI overviews in mainstream search, so all users in the United States will begin seeing them this week. Julia Love, who is inhaling it all, the hype man and all, when it comes to Google I.O. We thank you so much for joining us and setting us up into a conversation now from the investor perspective. Ioko Yoshioka is with us, Portfolio Manager and Wealth Enhancement Group. And Ioko, what did you make of ultimately Google wanting to basically outshine what OpenAI put out there yesterday? Did they manage to do that? Have they managed to convince us that they're not in some way behind in this race, but actually leading it? Sure, I think they did a great job this year of showcasing their capabilities with uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and, and really, you know, all the different types of ways that they are redefining what search really is for all of us, um, whether it's the overview portion um, within the, the traditional part of search or just being able to use your phone and, and the video screen in order to do a search um, music and all the other ways that um, search is evolving, I think is what was um, on display yesterday. Okay, the, the stakes are pretty high, right? You know, I was reflecting earlier in the show that the stock is up for a second day. But I think back to kind of some of the gaffes that the alphabets had as well in demoing its generative AI tools and how that's impacted the stock. Do you think they've done enough to convince investors for the long term that, that yeah, we got this on a consumer facing or business facing AI? You know, I think the landscape is rapidly evolving. And so I, I think it's difficult to say whether or not this is um, it, whether Alphabet or Google is really in that whole position at this point with AI. It's clearly got a much bigger competitive landscape. Um, than what was traditional search's competitive landscape. And so we'll have to see how this evolves um, over the, the coming months and years. Many feeling on the street that they've regained the AI initiative here. Many a consumer excited by how much better Gmail is going to become, for example. Mm. And many excited that maybe Google Glass is coming for a, for a reiteration and a, and a modern day take. But Ayoko, I'm interested ultimately as to whether this actually adds to revenue, adds to future profitability for a business when they're undercutting on a price perspective significantly OpenAI's offering. Absolutely. And then, you know, the cost of, you know, all of this AI integrating it into um, all the different programs that they will have, all the different offerings that they'll have is still going to continue to increase. And, and we saw that with the most recent quarter and their increase in capital spending for 2024. So we'll have to see how this really uh, shapes up from a financial perspective, um, both on the top line side, from a revenue perspective, as well as just the overall impact to earnings. Kara mentioned something really interesting, which is hardware is kind of back mm -hmm. and meta and the Ray Bands is coming up every week on the show. If you're an investor and a portfolio manager, do you sit at your desk in the morning and go, you know what? I've got to get the research desk on this hardware thing, on, on the hardware use case of AI. I'm not sure if I'm cool enough to, uh, you know, you get all of the hardware, whether it's Google Glass or uh, Meta's Ray Bands. Um, but, you know, I think everybody's looking for that next. Um, killer sort of technology, whether it's hardware or software. And, you know, that's the portion that I think everybody's still looking for when it comes to generative AI. Also, I think many forget that there is a weight on Google's shoulders here. They cannot roll out products in quite the same fast pace as a more startup version of a generative AI bid is at the moment because they've got billions of users. And already we've seen them rush, many would say, the image generation side of the equation and look at the, well, the backlash they got for that with Gemini. How much are you frustrated though by the fact that they're talking up a lot of things that then sort of leave for our imagination as and when they're gonna be in our hands? You know, it, it is a level of frustration when it comes to the overall communication um, from, from Google. I think they're, they are in a rush because they're in a position 
to sort of protect what they have um, and the, the pole position that they're in um, regarding search. So, you know, we'll see if they've kind of been able to refine some of that going forward. I think um, the most recent Google I.O. yesterday really showed that they were at least able to refine it from last year. Um, and so we'll see if that continues uh, next year. Ayako Yoshioka, Portfolio Manager at Wealth Enhancement Group. I think you are cool enough. Yeah. Come back on the show, bring your Meta Ray-Bans with you. Thank you. All right, we're watching shares of Sony as we head to break. Uh, Investor-friendly policies coming out overnight. Authorization uh, of uh, a buyback plan. That's been universally around the world something investors have cheered. Stock up 1.9% overnight. This is Bloomberg Technology. It's time for Talking Tech. And first up, the Yemeni government says they're holding back repairs on a key internet cable that's been damaged in the Red Sea. This comes as the government conducts an investigation into the cable owner's alleged ties to Houthi militia. The cable operators, Tele Yemen, control much of the damaged cables that connect Europe to Southeast Asia. The Yemeni government has notified 20 global group members of the probe into Tele Yemen's supposed associations with that group. Plus, Alphabet's YouTube has blocked videos of a Hong Kong protest song in the city just days after a local court approved the injunction. Google's video network said it will follow the court's ruling and block 32 versions of the video titled Glory to Hong Kong. While existing laws already punish people for playing the song on charges of sedition, the Chinese government has sought to erase it from all platforms. And PC maker Raspberry Pi says it's considering an IPO in London in what would be the first sizable listing for the city since February. The company says it intends to publish a registration doc with the London Stock Exchange, but did not disclose how much it plans to raise, Karen. Meanwhile, let's just shift our attention towards, well, a key founder, Andrew Hill founder, Palmer Lucky, about how his AI and autonomous systems are actually changing on the battlefield. We've been speaking to him, not only here on the show just last week, but... Well, Bloomberg Originals host Emily Chang caught up with him to discuss his mission to tackle legacy defense contractors and the challenges of scaling a defense tech unicorn. Let's take a listen. Right now, Anderol is very much in a high growth stage. We've done a lot of things that I'm very, very proud of, mm -hmm. but I'm very aware of the fact that we are not a profitable business. We mm -hmm. are living on borrowed time. And so I, 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 it's hard for me to come and feel like I've made it when I know that you know, anyone can raise money from VCs, right. buy a really big office and fill it full of people. The question is, are those people building the right things and will those things pay off? You can catch more of that conversation on The Circuit with Emily Chang tonight, 6 p.m. ET on Bloomberg Television. We'll go stream it at 8 p.m. on Bloomberg Originals. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's get you a quick check on these markets because we are at record highs, folks. And that is because the macro picture is one of inflation somewhat cooling. The CPI print was what the market wanted to see. And we're likely to see, therefore, record highs at the close for, at the moment, the Nasdaq 100, the Nasdaq, and indeed the S&P 500. Global benchmarks at record highs, too. The MSCI All World Country World Index up nine-tenths of a percent and a new record. And I'm looking at Bitcoin, all risk assets doing well in the idea that the Fed might actually cut this year, that being factored back in by the market, and we're up more than 5% on Bitcoin as the dollar goes lower. Move on to some of the individual movers. Well, a key player that's helping the benchmarks from a key points perspective is NVIDIA. We're up more than 3%, helps when you're worth more than two, three trillion dollars. But it's also notable that we're actually getting some 13F filings this morning, and a lot of more people actually upping their stakes in NVIDIA. Remember, their earnings come out next week. Monday.com, you shine a light on this, Ed, on the call. It's a small company but it's a big move. So we should highlight up more than 20%. This is about building APIs for work projects, in particular software that's doing well, it would seem, from a demand perspective at the moment. And Telecom Italia, maybe, just maybe, we're going to be bought by KKR. They're putting in their 22 billion euro bid. They're trying to get the EU on board with this. This is all about sort of the phone network ultimate of Telecom Italia. So at the close, we're up more than 2% over there in Europe for this particular player. But what are you looking at, Ed? Uh, a big story that broke pretty late 
yesterday, and that is OpenAI chief scientist and co-founder Ilya Sutskiva is leaving the artificial intelligence company. A departure that basically ends months of speculation in Silicon Valley about the future of who is a top AI researcher, someone that played a key role in the brief ouster of Sam Altman last year. Uh, joining us for more is Bloomberg Shireen Ghaffari. Uh, Shireen, um, OK, this is complicated because Ilya was, was at the centre of that mad weekend that you and I worked for 48 hours straight to work out what was going on. But he, he's one of the original founders, former board member of OpenAI, and he's saying, I'm leaving the company. I guess, do we know why specifically he's leaving OpenAI? So he didn't say much about exactly why he's leaving, but you know, we know that basically since um, the brief ouster of Sam Altman, Ilya Sutskever, who was once you know, a very... Um, common figure in the office has not been seen as much. Um, there was a lot of speculation, rumors about, well, what's going to happen with Ilya? Um, is he going to leave the company? And so, you know, internally, I think it wasn't so much of a big surprise to many people um, that eventually Ilya would leave. Now, what he's going to do next, he said he's going to, he has a new project and he'll share details in due time. So we're all waiting to see. Ultimately, this comes down, what was thought was a difference in opinion of the ultimate way you build generative artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence for the good of humanity. Is that what's underlying here, a philosophical, a philosophical difference? Or ultimately that there's other things that need to be built at this moment of in great exuberance around the technology? You know, I think it's really hard to say. What we do know is that Ilya Sutskever is someone who was working at these issues, kind of at the intersection, right, of ethics and AI. He co-led the super alignment team, is what they call it there, which is all about how to make sure that AI is aligned with human values. So, you know, of course, this is someone who's interested in the social implications of the technology that he's building. Now, whether ultimately his decision to leave is just because he'd rather do something else or because he he may um, have some deeper conflicts that are unsettled with the company, I think is still very much a, a big question. And also others leaving in his wake will have more to report out throughout the day. I'm sure Bloomberg's Shireen Ghaffari, thank you for breaking it down on that key well, departure coming from OpenAI. Now let's just stick with artificial intelligence and turn to the growing legal backlash against companies as they experience rapid growth. Now also how you can harness generative AI in the legal sphere too, we can have both of these conversations at the same time with Gila Hayat, CTO, co-founder of Darrow. Now, it's an AI-powered legal intelligence platform backed by Y Combinator. Your platform is used by some of the top US law firms. It connects over 3,000 litigators with new cases. Basically, you're facilitating over $10 billion in litigation. Gila, as if lawyers weren't busy enough, you're finding ways in which there can be well, group lawsuits brought. Interesting at the moment that we've just seen one versus the US government on behalf of TikTok happening. It's great. Uh, I, first of all, it's great to be here. Uh, and I also want to say about uh, justice intelligence in general. Um, so uh, the, to the question regarding whether lawyers are, are busy enough, um, our mission is um, to identify impactful cases that have a, a lot of so, both social and, uh, and, and legal impact around um, issues that are um, har basically harming consumers, uh, businesses, and employees. Um, we're mostly focused around uh, privacy issues, uh, consumer protection, uh, climate, environmental protection, which is uh, super, super important. And we're har harnessing uh, AI to do so, to identify socially impactful um, cases. Gila, how does the AI technology work? Yeah, so we are in a very interesting intersection uh, between um, looking at legal data and event data, which is pretty much anything that can happen on social media or events happening online. Um, and w the way we, we do so is we look at tremendous amounts of, of legal data, which are cases, case law, re regulations, new laws are coming in, and understanding what are the fact patterns that the case law is talking about and how those events take action on, on a re everyday life. Is this underpinned by a specific LLM or someone else's uh, AI model, or is it something you built yourself? 
Yeah, so the, the process is in heavily infused in LLMs, which is agnostic to what kind of LLMs that we're using, um, because it's a multi-step process, multi process which uh, ha takes into consideration ingesting the data, understanding what it is, and basically extracting the type of legal story or the legal phenomena that we're taking into action. So a lot of people assume that legalese is, is basically a different dialect of English, and they're correct to do so. And this is the kind of intersection that we're looking at. Oh, where boy, story... I know. Yeah. Sorry, so I didn't mean to interrupt, Gila. I, I, I suffered through three years of law school, and legalese went in one ear and out the other. Please continue your answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and as, as a non-lawyer myself, just as a tech person, I, I, I am fascinated by, by what kind of, how, how can we align this uh, type of language and make it usable uh, for, for consumers and for the people where um, often most of the legal violations that happen to them, they, they can happen pretty much in every kind of type of service or, or, or product or business that you're interacting with. And the, there is a constant fight over our attention, yeah. and and this is and, and this is what we're trying and, and trying to build, where we where, where consumers don't have to be worried about their their rights being violated, or even uh, the, the quality of air around them is deteriorating because there's not enough focus and not enough um, it, there's not enough power to the consumer to understand and to ingest that amount of data, and on yeah. the other side, lawyers. Um, it, it, the lawyers are only now starting to develop the intelligence gathering skills that are required in order to understand the full picture, supported by facts, and, and generally create more impactful cases. Yes. We've already heard some of the issues of hallucination when it comes to looking back at previous contracts, previous cases via the use of generative AI and sometimes in making them up. But Gila, I'm also interested, in, I can't imagine there's too many lawyers out there, too many companies out there upset that their contracts are being used as training data. But there's an awful lot of artists out there right now, an awful lot of creatives out there right now who are worried about their own creations being used in large language models. How much are you seeing that as an area you're wading into? So I think the, the, the discourse around AI and um, the, the concept of originality and the owners of the content is, uh, is, is, is a hot topic, and we should discuss it um, for, from multiple angles in a way that we want to keep um, encouraging originality and humanity and content creation around that so people will keep in innovating rather than just uh, replicating, um, replicating content that is, doesn't have much impact. Um, I think that also uh, from from the legal perspective, a lot of uh, um, high margin uh, task work, like con l l just like contracts, will be uh, scarce, and and the the focus will have to shift to different kind of tasks that require the core human impact and the core human seed that is required to create such a task. So um, I think in the next uh, in the upcoming years, we're going to see maybe different ways to compensate content creators and having a more um, more clear and transparent way of how this data is, go is going to be used. Um, in terms of hallucination, how, how we solved it at Darrow um, is that, first of all, we are validating, um, right. we're validating the content that we're creating because we are very, very focused on creating a trustworthy um, insight uh, based on our sources. And also, we are also providing the sources for uh, our clients to understand how we got to this decision. Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to replace decision right. making um, at, at its core, it, rather than empower um, um, the, uh, empower our client to understand how we got to this day, to, to this conclusion. Gila Hyatt, CTO and co-founder of Darrow. And Darrow named after Clarence Darrow, the 19th century lawyer from the Midwest who represented trade unions in all those high profile cases. Thank you so much. Now coming up, we're going to be joined by the CEO of Chime. Talk a little bit about fintech and discuss the company's new offering. More details on that next. Caro. Yeah, meanwhile, I just want to shine a light on some Lucas Shaw reporting, Ed, because Netflix apparently going after some key NFL games around the Christmas time. Once again, this foray into live events, this time live sports. It's an interesting take. We're just down 5 tenths percent, interestingly, on Netflix on the day, but they're likely to air two NFL games this Christmas day in its largest push into live events. This is Bloomberg Technology. Chime, the fintech known for its fee-free banking services, is now offering consumers the option of accessing as much as $500 of their paycheck 
before they arrive. Let's get more on this with Chime CEO Chris Britt, who joins me here in San Francisco. So it's interesting because you're offering the option to do this for free or if you want it instantly, $2. And you'd imagine that those that take up the offer would veer to the free side. Maybe not. What's in it for you guys? Well, Chime is all about helping everyday people unlock financial progress. We do that with a fee-free checking account and a host of services that help people with short-term liquidity and credit building. And what's in it for us with this new service called MyPay is that um, consumers would sign up for Chime, get direct deposit, and then, you know, if you think about the way payroll works in America, most yes. people get paid every two weeks. And so with this service, now every any point along that journey towards your next paycheck, you can access a portion of your paycheck up to $500. So what's in it for us is that we really want uh, to get people to sign up and use Chime as their primary bank account. And this is just another reason why people would Bring them into a broader sort of ecosystem. Uh, things are difficult right now to read on the consumer. So if you think about those that might be inclined to take advantage of my pay, they may also be under financial duress, right? So is there a technology in place that you guys use for risk assessment, for example, if somebody's eligible to do this? Oh, for sure. And I couldn't agree more. You know, it's something like 60 percent of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. So that doesn't mean everyone's under financial duress. But usually around the next time that your paycheck is is coming to your account, you probably have a low balance situation. And that's where banks oftentimes take advantage of consumers. So for us, uh, giving people access to to um, their payroll at an earlier clip is just a, a huge unlock for them and is extremely helpful uh, with them getting, you know, getting through, through to the next paycheck. It's a new area of banking services that has been popular elsewhere, Chris, and has sort of fallen into a legal gray area from a consumer protection perspective. How are you working with consumer rights groups? How are you working with government to ensure that you are above board at all times? That's a great point, actually. This, this whole category, it's referred to as Earned Wage Access, or EWA. Um, it's an emerging area. There's a number of companies that have popped up, and the regulation in the area is still, um, still sort of a work in progress. So we are um, uh, sort of monitoring that closely. We, we are in regular contact with regulators, but we've actually launched this product not as an EWA product, but actually as a credit product, and we've done it in coordination with our bank partners. So the legal construct for a credit product is um, you know, fully articulated, and we've been able to design a product that complies with all the rules and regulations the same way that we do with, with all of our products at Chime. Something else that is still work in progress is potentially you becoming a public company. Now, you said back in December the company was as IPO ready as it can be, and you're assessing how the markets look for the first half of 2024. So Chris, how do they look? Are you coming soon? The, uh, I think the markets actually look pretty good, and, and the business looks pretty good. You know, we, we ended uh, Q4 of last year as the number one most downloaded banking app in America. We have uh, over 7 million monthly transacting actives in the account and uh, it, use, using our uh, uh, Chime accounts. And the majority of our members are using us as a primary direct deposit and everyday spending uh, card. So... The business is performing extremely well. We actually had a profitable Q1. Um, we don't have IPO plans to announce in this uh, meeting today, but I would say that uh, an IPO is not too far out on the horizon. Probably not 24, but definitely something that we're thinking a lot about. So Chime's been really interesting to me. Some of your team know that, that they're here with us, but you had this $25 billion valuation in 2021, and the valuation's come down. That's not unique for your story. Um, are you kind of happy about that? We've seen down rounds or lower valuations set you up quite well for whatever future you decide. Well, valuations are always a moment in time, right? And they always fluctuate to some extent. Uh, we haven't done a new financing since 2021, so it's unclear, you know, what the market... Reported valuation, to be fair. Right. Yeah. You know, um, we don't think too much about that. We're sort of heads down, just focused on executing and not, not thinking too much about a specific valuation. But I do think that... The overall reset in the fintech category has been a great opportunity for us. Well, some companies are trying to, you know, figure out where they might land or, you know, merger opportunities or needing to raise money. We're extremely well capitalized. We have close to a billion dollars of cash on the balance sheet. So we've been able to, or not over, but close to a billion dollars of, of cash. So we've been able to stay aggressive and grow market share in a, in a period of, um, 
you know, d disruption for the category, and I think that's been good for, for us as a market leader. Uh, Chime CEO Chris Britt, it's just great to have you back in the studio here in San Francisco. Really appreciate it. Okay, stay with us, because coming up on Bloomberg Technology, we're going to be joined by the head of Rubrik Zero Labs for his outlook on the cybersecurity landscape. Be right back. This is Bloomberg Technology. Art for a moment because Christie's just managed to pull off a $150 million sale despite a cyber attack. It's an apparent hack that actually hobbled the company's website in the days leading up to the all-important May sales and Christie's website is actually still redirecting to a temporary site as the sale began and prompting questions around whether or not this New York auction could, would happen at all. But around the company's handling of the private client confidential information there were some concerns. Now a spokesperson told Bloomberg that, quote, Christie's continues to work with an additional team of technology experts who are determining the scope and the impact of this incident. Ed. Okay, and who better to talk about cybersecurity than Steve Stone, head of Rubrik Zero Labs, which recently put out its latest report called The State of Data Security, Measuring Your Data Risk. And I take this very seriously. Uh, Steve, because so many CISOs, CISOs, CIOs watch this program, and the conclusion of the report of those you surveyed is that almost all of them are suffering direct emotional, psychological impact from cyber attacks. I found that to be astonishing. Yeah, well, first, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here and excited to engage with your audience. And I think the emotional impact was one of the things that really jumped out at us. And I think it makes sense. If you... but what are we talking about here, emotional impact? So I think there's a few things. I think the first is the vast majority of more than 1,600 senior leaders, both in IT and security, we engaged with, you know, more than 90% of them reported having an emotional or psychological impact that ranged from losing sleep, um, fear over losing their job, or fear of their teams losing trust in them. And so we see that consistently year over year, and I think it really speaks to how this affects us as individuals and not just as businesses. Let's talk about how it affects businesses too, though, Steve, and how these CISOs, CIOs are trying to get a little bit of bed, better sleep by putting precautions in place. So I think that's the great question. That's the end point. We can talk about the problems all day long, but the real goal is reducing risk. And as we did this research, a few things jumped out at us that really impact that risk reduction and change that dynamic. First, organizations have to be prepared for a contested recovery. You see it in the news all the time. We've seen it for years. Really consistent touch point. You've got to recover your data. You have to be resilient. And the attackers know that, and they'll do their best to stop it. And the second part is, when we look at this from a data perspective, you have to involve a high number of teams. This is not a CISO problem. This is not a CIO problem. This is everyone's problem. Steve, very quickly, we're up against the end of the show. There must be a growing threat, therefore. What are, what are they facing from the other side of the table? I think the growing threat comes down to we're creating a risk surface area that we're not paying attention to. And that comes down to sensitive data. So if we look at healthcare, healthcare is in the news. There's not a unique threat to healthcare, but we see outsized impacts of ransomware against healthcare. 400% more sensitive data is impacted in a healthcare intrusion than in other industries. And that's not because it's different, it's not because the threats are novel, it comes down to sensitive data. And so when we look at how we change this, we've gotta start with where those impacts actually are. Very briefly, Steve, is it mainly the US where you're seeing the anxiety? Is this global phenomenon? We're seeing it globally. There are really consistent trends across all regions, all industries from a threat perspective, where we see the changes in impacts really come down to industry unique aspects. Steve Stone, taking us through the industries implicated, the individuals implicated. We thank you so much for some of the tactics to deploy. Steve Stone, he's head of Rubrik Zero Labs on all things cyber. Meanwhile, that's all things done on this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. I know I should be paying attention, I am, but during that conversation, a load of CIOs and CISOs added me on LinkedIn. <laughs> so we know they're watching. And if you have any reaction to Steve, get in touch with us or recap the conversation. In the show, Ed, with your social I don't media. get distracted. This is on the ground reporting. Uh, check out the podcast, recap that conversation with Steve and all the others, uh, particularly with Frank McCourt Jr. and his new bid for TikTok's US assets. You know where to find the pod. So many of you listening to us on your way to work, on your way home, in your lunch break, all around the world, and we really appreciate it. From SF in New York City, this is Bloomberg Technology.